people from uh, Germany might know you from the uh, that you're the organizer of the Pi Berlin um, meetups and that you've been around PyCon DE as well a lot. And of course, we've seen you at uh, other Europythons as well. Um, today, you want to talk about how to make your code production ready. Yes, exactly. So, uh, that's a super interesting topic because uh, when, when you do stuff in production, like now, things can break all the time. So how to make sure that that works is interesting for us. Are you ready to do your screen share? Yes, I am. Then ready. I hope you have a nice talk. So actually, I'm going to talk about uh, production ready code and whether our code is ready to be deployed somewhere or not. A few words about myself. Uh, thank you for a nice introduction. Um, I'm uh, basically uh, connecting from Berlin and I'm Pi Berlin organizer since already a year and a half. I have 10 years uh, in software development and seven years in Python. Actually, there is a very interesting story which I will quickly share before to start. Um, I'm here in Python because of the community most of the time. Um, on the conferences and I'm super happy that once our customer, I was a former C++ developer and one, once customer said that now you are a Python developer, you have to learn Python. I didn't understand how great was it because uh, back then I was in Ukraine and there was not much uh, of a community scene in Python at all. There was like C++, Java, and different meetups, but not Python at all. And then when I moved to Berlin, I realized that there is so much to learn and to share with the community. Everyone is so supportive. So I'm super happy that I'm here right now. And thank you for all the support. I know it's remote. I don't see anyone here right now, uh, but I can feel this support. Thank you so much. You're all invited to the next Pi Berlin meetup. And if you're uh, willing to speak for us, just feel free to drop by just a message or maybe just join the Pi Berlin channel. So uh, what exactly does production mean to you? Uh, what do you mean by production ready code? What's the difference of production ready and non-production ready code? Actually, I read the book, Release It. Um, it's great. And there is a favorite quote of this book is, uh, you work so hard on your project. It looks like all the features are actually complete and most even have tests, can, you can breathe a, a sigh of relief, you're done, or are you? There is no checklist um, what to uh, go through on your code if it's ready for production or not. Can you deploy already to your customers? So I prepared some checklist for you. Um, and before starting that, I would like to emphasize that the only difference between production and non-production code is that there is a customer behind the computer or behind of the device who is trying to run your code. The difference is that uh, we are developers. We know how our code is supposed to work. We know where to click, we know what to do on the website or the application or whatever we are building, but the customer doesn't know. The only difference that code could break and it will break, we have to make sure that we know how to investigate, how to find the problem and fix it, how to provide a solution to our customers. And here are the uh, checkpoints, what to check before going to production. So first of all, I will talk about exception handling. There was also a very good talk uh, yesterday about exception handling handling and um, I will also share some tips about that. And then how actually not to become a detective to find your problems in the code, how to make your login meaningful. Then um, how to set up your CI CD pipelines. I prepared some uh, beautiful examples. Um, and then uh, how to secure your Docker images. After that, I will show some links uh, then you can follow later on. So let's start with exceptions. We don't really want to show to our customers 500 error because it's like you can see this error and then you know that something is wrong on the server side. But as you're a customer, you cannot follow up on that. You can contact the administrator of the website. Usually there is an email to contact and then what to do with that. We don't really want to 
share this information with the customer. We want the customer to see some proper exception handling. If something went wrong, then they would know what to do, how to follow up for that. Uh, we are usually trying to handle exceptions in the manner that we are either silencing them or maybe just uh, using the try accept block to catch the exception and then printing something on our side, on the server side to see. So what's the proper way of handling exceptions? Um, we can try to catch exceptions and the base exceptions. Catching exceptions by official definition of exceptions in the official documentation is not a really good idea because it's too broad and catching the base exception is even dangerous. So it's highly not recommended to catch any base exceptions. So guess uh, what will be printed here. If you are trying to get some input from the terminal, you run this code and then you're trying to catch exception and the base exception. Then you're interrupting your script and then what would be printed next? You will get the base exception printed on the screen that keyboard interrupt happened. Why is it happening? Let's take a look into hierarchy of the exceptions. It's way longer. I just cropped the, the first top section. So basically base exception has more than exception. That's why it's not recommended to handle, to uh, try to catch base exception because you might catch more than just exception, which you're trying to catch. You will get also keyboard interrupt, system exit and generator exit. So in this case, we interrupted our script and then we got keyboard interrupt. In this case, if you will silent the exception, then what will happen next? Highly not recommended to use base exceptions. So how to actually handle exceptions? Let's try to take a look at this example. We're trying to catch exception of the exception class and then we will print some exception on the screen and then we need to change message of the exception to have something different like my custom message and then we will see on the screen that during handling the above exception another exception occurred that's not the ideal way because you were trying to handle exception and then you failed by while handling the exception that could happen also if you're trying to um, do some actions which might throw the exception on the handling but this is super high high not recommended so what can we do if we really need to change the exception message we can use from um, at the last line you can see that we are trying to raise the exception with the custom message so it's going to be a different exception but uh, we're raising it from exception with we which we already got so at the screen we will see the above exception was the direct cause of the following exception and then you can see correct trace back you will see the previous exception and the current exception and then you will see your awesome printed message the best way to handle exceptions is uh, to be more specific on the exceptions for example, you can create your custom exceptions with the custom message and then you can raise your custom exceptions whenever it's needed. You can try to catch your custom exceptions or specific exceptions to be more specific, not to use a broad version of just exception handling of exception. And then you can still print them on the screen. Last year at EuroPython in Basel, I saw a talk um, from Mario Cojero, Exceptional Exceptions. It was really, really good. There are more tips to learn. Um, and you can see the video from PyCon US in here. Highly recommended to uh, watch it and to go through all of the tips. The next step is logging. How to make your logging meaningful. Um, let's take a look. What are the logs? In the 12 factor app, which was super popular a few years ago everyone was talking about 12 factor app nowadays i heard some talks about that some people mentioning that but not that much anymore um but actually they have really good content and uh feel free to go to the 12 factor app and check the logs section so they're saying that um we have to treat logs as event streams and logs provide visibility into the behavior of a running application 
Um, so let's take a look at the basics of logs. Uh, what should log include? I did some research and then I found out that the main uh, login attributes are when, where, what, who, and the outcome itself. So when would be the just a timestamp when the log entry uh, happened, then where did it happen? Maybe passed to the file, um, then what actually happened if it was exception or maybe just information. Um, then who did this action? If there is a user, then maybe some kind of ID information, but no customer information at all. I make sure that you're following all the GDPR principles and you're not logging any customer information. And then also important to have an outcome, the message itself. So how can we improve our logs? Usually we are having this type of logs. Uh, we are using the standard logger and then we are putting everything into a one log message. So I added here some important information about the conference name the talk name and also some random key ID. After printing this, we will see something like this. So then we have a log level, we have where this log message happened. We can also add the timestamp super easily. And then we have the entire message. This is not super useful if we're trying to find out what actually happened on our system. So how can we improve that? And how can we make the log message uh, more uh, parsable for DevOps team, if we have a DevOps team or we are our own DevOpses and we're trying to build some boards on the top of the log messages. In this case, we cannot really check by the conference name because, for example, if we separate by commas uh, the log message, then we will still get um, some random stuff. If, for example, in the talk name, we have comma in, in, inside of the talk name. If we try to separate by, um, I don't know, some other ID or maybe we will have ID friendly, then we need to make sure that everyone uses the same uh, structure of the locks, the same um, quality of the locks, which is quite hard to establish. So what, what actually I tried in uh, my teams, uh, we use the struct log for that. Um, there are also great talks about the struct log and uh, there are lots of examples in official documentation. I will show you some examples uh, which I use myself. So super easy, you just um, get the logger instance and then uh, you try to use the same, we are, we are trying to use the same um, information from the previous log so we will have also key ID, conference name, and talk name. But the structure in here is a key value pair. So what will we get actually? We will have um, the log message and then keywords. We can easily parse uh, by the name of the keyword and then we can get the value to build the dashboards on that, which will show us way more than just um, going through millions of logs from just our servers. So yes, definitely recommended to use the struct log. And let's take a look um, at the features of it. For example, um, here we can bind some important keys to every log entry. In this case, uh, for example, I have the entire big file uh, with all the logs, um, log entries, like info, exception, whatever we need to log. And then I need to have conference name, talk name, and key ID in every log entry. Obviously, I would not write, like just copy paste in the entire um, line to every log message. Um, it's possible to use just bind and then in every log message we will have the same keywords already there. So we just don't need to specify them over and over again to, through the all log messages. Then we will get the same exception handling and then we will see our beautiful log message. For the development, we, ha we can have this uh, highlight on we can use Colorama for that. And for um, 
servers, we just don't need that. Also, we can use JSON format for logs. Then we will see event as a message of the log. Then we will see the EuroPython um, custom log level. I will show that in a minute. And then the no name of the logger and the time step and many more. So let's show me, let me show you some code. I hope you can see my screen with the pie charm. So this is the basic idea. Then let's take a look at the processors. So what do we have in here? We have some password in the log message, which we wanted to print, but actually we don't want to have any customer information in here. Because of that, we can use a super custom processor. We can write the processor ourselves. And then after that, we will have the password censored. We can also use tracing uh, from the struct log. We can, um, for example, pass the trace ID from one service to the other one and then just add it to the log message, which would show us um, how this actually um, error transferred from one um, message to the other one. And also many more features. You can add so many processors and features into this one, but we're uh, running out of time. So I want to show you um, a bit um, more of different features. I wrote everything in the blog post. I will share links later on so you can follow uh, all the um, ideas later on. So. And this is a really good talk um, about the struct log with more examples. Effective CI CD. I prepared also some examples for you and I will share them after this talk. Um, continuous integration and why do we need it? It will provide you the test coverage, reliability, fault isolation, transparency, code quality, faster development, and code review improvements. You can automate everything. Um, there are diff different examples of how to integrate uh, your uh, checks into the CI, and I will show you some super tiny example with the GitHub Actions, which is super easy, simple to set up. You just go to actions and then you click on the um, specific CI which is already proposed and then you can edit it easily. I have chosen the Python application setup. Here's the link to uh, the test setup. You can check it out afterwards and I will show you how it looks at a moment. So basically we have GitHub workflows and then we can have our beautiful workflow. I added everything in here. The only difference between uh, those different entries is this continue on error. If you want to make sure that a uh, developer cannot really merge the code before the CI is passing, you have to delete this line, continue on error. Um, but if you don't really care, you just want to see how it looks on the CI, then you can just uh, continue on error and run all of the checks before they're fixed. But then we cannot really make sure that CI is actually passing. Um, so in here, we have the CI part, and then here are all the jobs. Basically, this one is the only one which is mandatory for my code, and all the other ones are not really passing because I didn't really uh, care to fix, just to show you the difference. Uh, let's check the pylint. Pylint is not passing because there is something which is missing in here. Also, I sort is not passing, but actually my code was already merged because I didn't make that mandatory. So make sure that those steps which are important for you to check are mandatory. And there is also a really nice tool which is called uh, documentation coverage tool interrogate. You can check that a bit later. Uh, I don't have any documentation right now. Um, so it's obviously failing because actual result is the zero. Um, you can use it like this, interrogate, and then just specify what do you want to check if there is enough documentation. Then the Docker file. 
just a couple of words about the Docker file, how to secure your Docker file and Docker images. I also prepared a lot of examples, which you can check uh, later on after the talk. So uh, the basic advice, do not use the root user. Um, then uh, use trusted well-known images. Just check on the Docker Hub if the image has uh, enough downloads and it's an official source. Then use copy instead of add. Um, although they have super similar uh, functionality, uh, but then um, add can have extra functionality which you will not expect. So make sure that you're using copy. And then try to link your Docker files. You can use that on the CI. It's super easy and simple. Um, I use one tool which is called Hadolint. Uh, it's a Docker file linter. It will lint your code super easily. It will tell you what's wrong in the code. This is just an example for them. It's super easy to set up on the CI. Uh, so in this Docker file, I made a mistake. I uh, did the pip install and then just the package name. I didn't pin the dependencies. And because of that, my linter um, advised me to change that. Whenever I changed, then it was passing. Also, uh, this linter will let you know whenever you're using um, add instead of copy. So you don't need to worry about that as well. And um, the last but not least, you can also check vulnerabilities in your code. I didn't try it myself, um, but I will definitely try. And I saw that there is uh, already interesting tool, which is uh, sort of for free and I'm going to give it a try. Um, and a bit more hints how to use um, not a root user in the Docker files. You need to create a user, you need to create a group. And why do we actually do that all? Uh, because uh, we would like to follow the principle of the least privilege here. And that means that we should give access only um, to resources uh, to perform their required function. So if they need to refer perform the, just a function with no root user, obviously we will not give them root access. Um, and I have some recommendation of the books for the further reading. Um, and also you can find all the links here in, in my um, personal blog. So thank you for listening. And I believe we don't have so much time for questions. <laughs> No, actually, we are very good on time at the moment, but I don't see many questions at the moment because uh, in the chat, uh, nobody has asked any. I think you just gave them an overview so that they have the time to think about this. Uh, I really like the Docker tips that you gave, and there was also another Docker talk yesterday. So if somebody is into Docker, then they should look at the other talks as well. So yeah, it was a really good talk. Highly recommended yep. to check it out. As well, yes. So uh, the only thing that's left to me is to give you a round of applause.